Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for being willing to stay later on a Friday and talk about deployment practices. So by a show of hands, who here has had a bug that has made it to production that caused an incident? OK, yeah, pretty much everyone. Now, keep your hand raised if following that incident, you thought, hmm, that took a little bit longer to fix than I thought it should have. OK, yeah, <laughs> me too. So I want to tell you about one specific time that ended up sending us down a multiple year journey to improve our deployment practices. This was a few years ago when we were deploying a new version to cloud, and we had spent the morning manually building it, then the afternoon manually deploying it, and then bam, alerts start firing, escalations are coming in. It turns out that the new feature that we had deployed had a problem that had a more cascading effect on the system. So the evening we spent rolling back the new version. The next morning, the developers come in and they start working on a fix, and we think we have one. So again, we spend the morning manually building it, then the afternoon manually rolling it, uh, manually rolling it out, and then bam, more alerts start firing, escalations are coming in. It turns out that the fix worked slightly differently locally than it did in cloud. So again, we manually roll it back. At this point, our users are understandably getting frustrated because with that release, there had been bug fixes that some of them had been waiting for. So understandably, frustration was growing amongst the users. The next morning, the developers come in, we figure out what the difference was between local and cloud, patch it, ship it to cloud, and finally, the incident is over. But we still had a multiple year journey ahead of us to improve our deployment practices. So we're here to tell you about our journey in hopes that you all can get some better sleep while on call and your users can experience a more smooth release process. So hi, I am Stephanie Hinchgen and I am a senior software engineer at Grafana Labs. Hi, I am Michael Mandras. I'm also a senior software engineer at Grafana Labs. And this is our guide to sane and safe cloud deployments. So let's look back at where we were at the beginning of that incident. At the time, we had our priority towards on-prem releases. So we were building our on-prem releases and then shipping those manually to cloud. Now those manual shipments to cloud were pretty tedious and so we only did those monthly. And since we only did those monthly and had 100 plus engineers working on that software, those were pretty large changes that included features and bug fixes. So when we had a problem, we had to roll back the new features along with all the bug fixes that had been shipped. Luckily, that's not where we are today. Today, we have automated deployments that are going to cloud first, and that benefits our cloud users because now they're thought of as first-party citizens in the whole release process, but it also benefits our on-prem users because now they're getting releases that have been proven in cloud over that month. We also have flexible deployment schedules in cloud that go from either hourly internally to all the way to monthly. And then we also have the feature releases separated from bug fixes, so we're not rolling back bug fixes as often. Now, this of course did not happen overnight. This was a three-year journey for us. So we started out the first year doing decoupling of features and bug fix releases. Then we spent an entire year doing a lot of developer enablement and then followed it up with a lot of automation on our cloud rollouts. All right, so the first thing we'll talk about is uh, separating features from bug fixes. Uh, as Stephanie was just talking about, this is bad for developers, uh, it's bad for users. So we had to come up with a way to uh, separate these out. Um, what we ended up going with was uh, feature toggles. Um, you might have also heard them called feature flags. Uh, but they're essentially just Boolean gates that activate or deactivate certain code paths. Uh, this is not something we came up with, but uh, at the time uh, in 2019, uh, we, we did start building this from the ground up, uh, and it's evolved over the years. Uh, and um, after a lot of iterating and getting feedback from developers and dealing with incidents and whatnot, we finally figured out a uh, feature toggle definition that works well for us. Um, so first of all, we have a name and description, so we want it to be very easy to figure out what a feature toggle is doing. Um, then we have the feature toggle stage. So uh, these range from experimental, which is uh, just a beginner feature. We're trying something out. It may never see the light of day. Um, then we have private and public preview, which are different groups of users starting to use the features. You can think of these as alpha and beta if you want. 
Uh, then we have generally available, which means everyone can have the toggle and uh, the risk is minimal. And then finally deprecated means we decided not to go forward with the toggle and we're removing it. Um, we also have the feature toggle owner. Uh, and this was something we didn't have initially, uh, we added later on, but this has been really important as it makes it really easy to track down the right team uh, if you have questions or issues. Uh, so we definitely recommend adding that. So once you have a feature toggle defined, oops, sorry. Uh, once you have a feature toggle defined, um, you'll wanna start calling it from within your code. Uh, we have a couple of examples here, uh, using them on the back end and front end. Um, but as I said before, these just uh, activate or deactivate certain code paths based on a Boolean condition. Um, so in 2019, when we started building this, there weren't really too many options for this sort of thing. But nowadays, uh, there's a CNCF project called Open Feature. Um, we've been thinking about trying this for a while, but we just haven't had the time for it yet. So if you do start to explore feature toggles, uh, we definitely recommend looking at Open Feature. And uh, if you have any lessons learned from it, we'd love to hear from you. All right, so now we have feature toggles defined and being used in the code. Uh, the next thing we need to do is define a way to roll these feature toggles out to different cloud environments. Um, so we ended up building something fairly specific to uh, Grafana's internal um, SaaS infrastructure. Um, but uh, essentially, you just, at a minimum, name the feature toggle and then the minimum version at which that feature toggle can be rolled out. Um, we've added additional filtering mechanisms on top of this as needed. So you can roll out to different customer groups if you want. Uh, you can roll out to different percentages of users. Um, so this just lets you gradually roll your toggles out over time do a little bit of sanity checking before increasing the, uh, the toggle rollout into more users. Uh, our one recommendation here, well, we have a lot of recommendations, but one crucial thing is um, if you are using a percentage-based rollout, just make sure you're randomizing which users are getting those changes each time. You don't want the same 10% of users testing all of your feature toggles, so make sure you vary it. Oh, the slide's animated now. All right, um, so once you have your uh, feature toggles defined and uh, you, st you wanna start thinking about what your rollout practices will look like. Um, so we recommend a, uh, a uh, progressive rollout starting from internal instances and going eventually to production instances. So we start out by rolling our feature toggles out to our dev instances. These are just internal instances that Grafana users can, can start up and test with. Um, then, if those look good, we roll out to our staging environment. Uh, this is also an internal-only environment, but we have our um, most heavily used internal instance on it. It's uh, what we use for many of our operations, uh, all of our on-call and incident, um, data tracking, uh, monitoring our infrastructure. So um, a lot of people use this instance, and if there's something wrong with your feature toggle, it's, there's a good chance it's gonna be caught in the uh, staging environment. Uh, then finally, if that all looks good, then after a period of time, we'll recommend rolling out to Canary, which is a small percentage of end users. And then eventually, uh, if that looks good, we'll roll out to production, which is uh, the rest of our uh, end users. Um, lastly, you'll want to think about um, when, when your developers should actually use feature toggles. And this is actually the hardest question to answer. And it's, we still haven't really come up with a strict set of guidelines for it. Uh, it's, more, um, it's more about educating developers and making sure that they can write, make the right decisions, uh, providing them with a lot of data so that they can base their decisions off previous use cases. Um, one important thing to think about is too many feature toggles versus too few. Um, using feature toggles for everything sounds great, but if you start to have too many, then you can get into some spaghetti code situations. Uh, also, a lot of feature toggles may interact with each other in ways that you don't expect. So uh, you don't wanna just go completely crazy with them. On the other hand, you don't wanna have too few or you just start getting back into the scenario we had before uh, where we just had too many features bundled with bug fixes. Um, the other challenging thing is defining what a feature actually is. So um, for example, a bug fix that is very visible to users noticeably causing an issue most likely not gonna go behind a feature toggle. It's just a bug fix, just roll it out. Uh, if it's a big new feature that has a very large visible user impact, that most likely should be behind a feature toggle. But then there's this whole other category of like if efficiency improvements and refactors. Um, and this kind of just comes down to the use case again. Um, but for example, if you're doing a refactor and you find yourself referencing the feature toggle over and over, 
maybe it's an indication that you're starting to get towards spaghetti code and you might want to consider a different approach. Um, our main recommendation here is just be flexible, um, make guidelines, not rules. Um, you don't want to frustrate the people who are supposed to be using this. So just make sure you're constantly working with developers to make sure they understand what feature toggles are for and, and when they should or maybe shouldn't use them. All right, so a couple more lessons just to save a little bit of time for everyone. So we already talked about feature toggle ownership. It's very important to know which team is responsible for a feature toggle. So we recommend adding that in early on. Um, feature toggle lifecycle is another one that we've only started thinking about more recently as our feature toggle registry has started to grow. Um, you want to start thinking about early on when should feature toggles actually be removed. Uh, for example, if something's been in GA for a year and it's been enabled for all users, then at that point probably it shouldn't be a feature toggle, it should just be the main code path. Um, so thinking about lifecycle and setting up some sort of automated reminders or just recurring meetings to revisit feature toggles is something we would recommend. And then finally, chaos testing. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of these feature toggles can interact with each other in unexpected ways. Uh, it's very hard to catch every issue uh, before things make it out to production. So we would also recommend setting up some sort of randomized feature toggle rollouts and doing uh, tests that way. So in summary, decoupling feature toggles and bug fixes is better for developers and users and for your releases. Um, you want to make your feature toggle framework uh, convenient and easy for developers to use uh, and make sure that you're making guidelines, not rules, and taking into account developer needs as you go. Cool. So once you have the feature toggle release framework done, the next step is to work on empowering developers to feel comfortable utilizing that tool, but also feeling confident in deploying to cloud. So this chapter, we spent a lot of time doing developer enablement. And what that all looked like was knowledge sharing mainly. We needed to share the why we needed this change, the how, and also make sure that the knowledge sharing was bi-directional and we were getting feedback. So for the why, by asking developers to take on more responsibilities of deploying their features to cloud, we were putting additional load on them. So it was really important that they were able to understand the why behind it and what them themselves had to gain as well as the users. So we boiled it down to three key reasons. The first was happier users, since we no longer were shipping out features and bug fixes together and then having to roll back bug fixes once we had rolled out a feature that had a problem, our users were experiencing a much more stable environment and therefore were a lot happier. Additionally, for developers, they were experiencing a lot less urgent feature fixes because now if we had an incident with a feature, we could just roll back the feature toggle rather than having to roll back the entire version and then having their fix be dependent on these bug fixes. Lastly, for the developers, they could have quicker feedback loops. Previously, they had to wait until the correct December version to make changes on their features or release their features, but now they could release their features behind a feature toggle in cloud, have it even GA in cloud before it ever got to an on-prem release. So once we had boiled down our main reasons why, we continued to reiterate it so that we were all working towards the same goals and keeping those in mind. So while your whys may differ, the key thing is really to boil it down to a few key reasons why and then share them and be transparent. Next was the how. And this was not just how to use this feature release framework we had built, but it was also how do I feel confident in deploying to cloud, particularly for developers who haven't gotten the chance to do that before. So the first was to make sure that they had a good production-like environment that they could test in. So at first we just wrote a guide of here's how you can do this. But pretty quickly, we needed to change that and add in frequent main builds so that they could test the newest changes that they had had. Then we eventually decided to build on that even more and create what we call ephemeral instances. But what you do here is you comment on a PR and it triggers a GitHub action in the background, builds that new code, and then creates a cloud-like environment for them where they can go ahead and test that before it ever gets merged into main. So this is a great way for developers to be able to test their features and make sure that they're working as expected in cloud. But outside of that, it's hard to know what is this feature having an impact on in cloud and on the software. And so what we ended up building was this feature readiness review. And what this is, is a dashboard that goes through different steps of things that they can look at. So the first step 
is just that guide that we had seen before of here's how you enable it on your instance, test it, make sure your feature's working. But then the next step is here's how to look at the software as a whole. And so this is looking at what kind of crash loops are happening on the pod itself, any pod error logs that we're seeing, as well as API latency or database query latency or database errors or API errors. So once they see that their feature isn't making an impact on that, the next step would be to look at the resource utilization and how that will impact cloud as a whole. And so here you can see with the vertical blue line, that is where I've enabled a new feature toggle, KubeCon demo. And at the top, you can see that the memory spikes up a little bit afterwards, but it evens out. And then that correlates to no increase in cloud cost. However, the CPU starts spiking up quite a bit afterwards, and that ends up correlating to $187 of difference in cloud cost. So they can use this, see, okay, this is not as efficient on CPU as possible. Let me see if I can make some changes and decrease that number. And now I'm gonna go through the PromQL query that's behind the $187 because it's a little complex, and so I wanna save you some time. So this is the pseudocode for it. And the first section of it is just looking at the difference in memory or CPU utilization of your feature. Then you're gonna multiply that by the cost per unit for the cost per gig or the cost per core, and then you'll multiply that by the scale, so the number of replicas you're running across how many clusters. So diving into that, what that looks like is you're taking the average container memory usage bytes, and then you're doing it unless the feature toggle info is zero or unless the feature is off. The feature toggle info is a specific metric we added to our software, so you'll have to add that as well to emit metrics on when a feature is on or off. Then you'll subtract it with unless the feature is on, and you'll get, or unless the feature is off, and then you'll get the difference. Then you're gonna multiply it by the cost per unit, and so what that looks like is taking the cost of the namespace and then dividing that by the amount available in our node pool. So one thing to note here is we run a specific node pool for our workload and our workload is isolated to one namespace. So that works for our workload. If that is not the case for you, you can get an approximation by taking off the namespace label and the node label to get an average of the amount that it costs for a gig in your cluster. And then you'll multiply it by the amount of replicas in all of your clusters. So altogether, this is what it looks like. The cost per month actual, if you don't have that already, our colleagues at KubeCon North America gave a talk on how they implemented that metric. And so at the end of the presentation, we'll have a QR code that goes to their YouTube video if you wanna see that. So then finally, they are ready to deploy it. And the last step in deploying that we have is this production readiness review. And this is just a quick last check of yes or no questions that are either cloud specific or company specific. So Grafana is an observability company, so one of the questions that we ask is, does your feature emit metrics? But yours will vary based on what's important to your company or different things that you have experienced in cloud before. And so customize it to fit that, and then the developers are ready to release and use the feature toggle framework. Now, since this was an internal framework that we did, we tried to supply as many possible ways of learning about it as possible. So whatever's easiest for people, they can learn that way. So we had a course, a uh, walkthrough with guides, presentations with Q&A, all of those things. And then although this is at the end, this should be done throughout. You should be soliciting feedback and asking the developers, what are they uncomfortable with? If they haven't had experience in, in deploying to cloud before, what makes them nervous? And how can you help them see that their feature is ready for cloud and feel confident in deploying to cloud? And also one mistake we had made throughout the process is we assumed at first that this would mainly be used by backend engineers. And so we talked mainly to the backend engineers, but then it ended up having a lot of use cases in the front end. And so then we needed to go back and rework things and help them too. So try to talk to as many people as you can in as many roles as you can and figure out what their experience is and what they're nervous about. So in the lessons that we've learned in this chapter, first is to start with the why. When you're asking developers to, or anyone, to make changes, naturally we want to know why we're making these changes so that we can get behind them. So start with the why, make sure that you have it into a core few reasons. Then make sure that it's easy to test and to learn about cloud. 
We strongly believe that convenience will drive adoption, so make it as convenient as possible. And then finally, make sure that the knowledge sharing is going both ways the entire time. Okay, so at this point, we have uh, feature toggles. Um, we have less risky deployments, so we can finally start deploying more often. This was a goal of ours for a while, but we weren't really able to do it because of the state of our releases. Um, before, it would have been, been counterintuitive that more often releases is riskier, but at this point, we've actually minimized that risk as our releases are a lot smaller. So the technique we use for our rollouts is something that we call rolling release channels. Uh, this was inspired by the Google Kubernetes engine release channels, but the concept is that you just have different channels that receive software updates at different intervals. And the channels on the slower end of the spectrum get only validated releases from the earlier on channels. So in this example here, we have, a, uh, we have four channels, one that we call instant, running on a weekly cadence, uh, one called fast, running every other week, uh, one called um, steady, running every three weeks, and then slow is every four weeks. Uh, and so we can see in the top row, um, Instant is deployed for a week. It then, because it was okay for a week, it goes on fast and so on until eventually we get to slow. So by the time changes make it to the slow channel, they've been running in cloud and being validated for four weeks. Um, we have quality gates along the way that we use uh, in order to detect bad builds. And we also have a way to manually mark builds as bad. Um, but the way this works is uh, we have automated tests that run in each channel that we have. We have a couple of test instances, and we use the uh, Grafana tool uh, K6 to do load testing and, yeah, just run a test suite against each of those instances. It's hard, hard word to say, instances. Uh, if we uh, catch any issues with those, uh, we'll remove them from the pipeline immediately. You can see in uh, V3 instant, um, we detect an issue, so we pull it completely, and uh, it's um, V2 that gets promoted to fast instead of V3 as a result. Um, I talked about, uh, yeah, validating your versions and, and some of the quality tests, uh, quality tests we're running. Um, like I said, we're using K6. Uh, we also just have a way if, if anyone's testing and something managed to slip through the cracks and we have an issue, we can immediately mark a build as bad and completely remove it from the build pipeline. So once you have your release channels, you want to think about your user distribution on those channels. And we recommend doing something like this. Uh, we, again, drew inspiration from Google on this. Uh, so first, we have our, uh, our instant channel is all internal instances. So this is pretty much as soon as a developer uh, commits a change, they can start testing it out on a Grafana instance that's on the instant channel. Um, from there, once we start rolling out to users, we prioritize or replace users in different categories depending on their needs. So users on the fast channel might be more interested in getting new features sooner and testing them out, and they're okay accepting a good amount of risk. Uh, whereas on the slow end, this is more reserved for enterprises who can't really afford that risk and just want the most stable, proven features. And then a bunch of people in the middle. Um, so yeah, we're, we follow the bell curve. We recommend the same. Uh, and then finally, we want to add observability into this. So it's developers who are going to be using this and caring about it. So we want to make it easy for them to figure out what's going on with release channels at any given time. Um, so given that we are Grafana, we did this through a dashboard. So we just have a big dashboard living on our uh, big internal instance that I talked about earlier. Just lets you see the state of each uh, release channel, which commits deploy where, and we have other tools that let developers figure out when their commits are going to make it to certain channels. Uh, so yeah, summarizing lessons learned here. Um, if you've completed chapter one and two in our little story here, um, it'll make uh, deploying less risky. Um, all right, yeah, internal usage, dog fooding, very important. Uh, Grafana has a strong culture of dog fooding. Uh, not my favorite term, but essentially means you're testing out your own software uh, extensively. Um, and then, yeah, if you take anything from this talk, it's uh, work with your developers. Um, they're building the thing. Make sure you're soliciting feedback from them and factoring in their needs, not just your own. And uh, that's pretty much it. So we are still on this journey. Of course, we're, we're not perfect. We're still trying to improve things. But um, if you happen to want to explore a path like this, 
Um, we're definitely looking forward to hearing any of your thoughts, uh, experiences, and we'll continue to share ours. That's it. Any questions? So if you have any questions, I think there's a mic that will be run around to you, so just raise your hand. And then... Cool. Oh, okay, sorry. One over there. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you said at the beginning that your deployment uh, were flexible, your deployment uh, releases, you were making them as flexible as possible, but at the end you presented four different channels. So I have just two questions like, does the developer have to uh, fit in one of those channels or do you have also maybe uh, other like critical deployments or things like that? So this was specifically for how we release Grafana, but there are different softwares that we release so they can follow their own uh, deployment schedule from there. Um, yeah, in the example that we gave to, it was uh, every week cadence. We actually have hourly, um, daily, weekly, and monthly. It was just a easier way of showing the concept by going by the week by week. But Thank you. That, okay, cool. Yeah, thank you.